In this the second session, we will look at the shape of faith in a post-Christendom context. The journey from pre-Christendom to post-Christendom has taken 2,000 years, and 1,700 of these years have been taken up with the story of Christendom. So let us now look at pre-Christendom, Christendom to post-Christendom, the transition. Pre-Christendom is the era of the first three centuries when Christians were a minority group. They were totally dominated by the all-pervasive Roman Empire and their minority and often suffering status needs to be understood in that context. The first churches were very small communities and might even be better described as the Jesus movement. They were small house churches, a room in a tenement building or a shop, or a house owned by a wealthy Christian sponsor. For example, Paul's first letter was to Christians in Thessalonica, and the community would probably have been no larger than 20 to 24 people. The earliest roots of the Jesus movement were Jewish, Jesus himself being a Jew. These small communities within the Jesus movement were characterised by internal relational tensions and these tensions were often rooted in ethnicity, gender and class. The tensions that emerged when people of other ethnic groups, often described as Gentiles, were attracted to the Jesus movement were very obvious in a number of Paul's letters. For the first three centuries, the Christian faith was strongly pacifist. That is, it was characterised by active non-violence and a refusal to be involved in the military. This was in line with the unequivocal teaching and the praxis of Jesus, which was about active non-violence, strongly contrasting with Roman militarism and Jewish paramilitary groups. The context for the pre-Christendom community was the dominating presence of the Roman Empire with faith being over against empire. Faith was also a subversive and alternative witness within the pre-Christendom community, and it was a witness to God's alternative empire or kingdom that stood in contrast to all the Roman Empire represented. The core teaching of Jesus then was the kingdom or reign of God, kingdom being understood as another word for empire. This liberating empire of God was subversive of Roman militarism and violence. Christians in the first three centuries were a minority group. Unlike later centuries, the earliest followers of Jesus had no privileged status within Roman-dominated society. Their role in this imperial world was to witness to the critical alternative perspective that was endorsed within the Jesus movement. Christendom. By the early 4th century, there was a massive change in the role and status of Christians within the empire. But what accounted for this? At this time, the Roman Empire was in crisis. It was very insecure. At the famous Battle of Milvian Bridge, which took place outside Rome, Constantine prayed and claimed to see a cross of light with the inscription, By this sign conquer. Constantine won the battle. He entered Rome in triumph, the sole emperor, and he offered prayers to the Christian God. The Edict of Milan in 313 CE ended the persecution of Christians and gave them freedom and privilege. Constantine had equated his victory at Milvian Bridge to God, the Christian God. This new perspective and status meant a reversal of role for the Christian Church. The Christian Church was now closely aligned with political and imperial power, and increasingly the Church began to reflect this very imperialism. State funding built large churches, paid clergy their salaries, and decided that the Bishop of Rome should have a large palace, an imperial style basilica, St John Lateran's Cathedral. God and empire were now one, 
and as a result, the shape of theology changed. In this very different context, God was perceived as an almighty, powerful, imperial figure. And the Jesus of the Gospels was beginning to look like a warrior king. Constantine also presided over the church councils that developed creedal statements, where faith was now defined as belief and orthodoxy. Constantine closed the canon of scripture and he imposed the only authorised interpretation of it. This was a man who enjoyed control. These actions closed off the possibilities for diversity and the church moved into a model of rigid uniformity and conformity. And it was at this time that the word heresy was invented. By 391 CE, the marriage of church and state became even stronger because in 391, the emperor Theodosius legalized the Christian faith, making it the only legal religion in the empire. In other words, it became a state religion. This also meant that all other religions were declared illegal and that also included Judaism, which drove a complete wedge between Christianity and its roots in Judaism itself. Orthodox Christianity had now become the enforced norm. And once you have an enforced norm, then error has no rights or those who deviate from it have lesser rights. Also, Christian society becomes dominated by Christian symbols and Christian rituals and holidays, Sunday being one example. The church-state relationship was inseparable. Now the church was in a role where it legitimised the state, it blessed its armies and its wars, and it provided the rituals on state and military occasions. The state in turn gave the church protection and privilege, and the church now had a role at the very centre of society. But Christendom did not last forever, and so we moved to post-Christendom. The Christendom model remained in the West for over 1700 years, but it was shattered, especially by the brutal events of the 20th century which in fact have been described as the end of Christendom or the death of Christendom. The death throes of Christendom had actually begun earlier, at the end of the 18th century. Then the French Revolution had blasted a gaping hole in the ship of Christendom, the god of absolute power and absolute monarchy, and absolute clericalism, was fatally wounded. The 20th century and its events then accelerated the growth of secularism and pluralism and the cultural disestablishment or deprivileging of institutional Christianity. Secularization for the institutional church means the radical shift in its relationship to power. From being once at the centre of political power, the Western church now finds itself decentered. It now finds itself marginalised and on the periphery. It no longer has the monopoly on goodness or spirituality or even on the monopoly of the truth about God. The journey from belief to faith. The journey from pre-Christendom through 17 centuries of Christendom has changed the nature of faith. It might even be said that the journey has moved from faith to belief, where faith was in belief systems, and in more recent times, there's been a movement back again to faith as trust and faith as openness. Faith is at the heart of Christianity. Its centrality goes back to the Christian Testament. All but two of its 27 books use the noun faith or the verb believe. But what do we mean by the word faith? In Christian history, it has had four main meanings. The first sees faith as assent. In other words, faith is an intellectual assent to a set of propositions or theological formulations, what we might call doctrines 
or right beliefs. The term orthodoxy rings true here. Right beliefs imply there are also wrong beliefs. And this in turn also implies that those who do not assent to orthodoxy are characterised as heretics. Their fate becomes one of exclusion and often suffering of various kinds. Secondly, faith has been determined or defined as trust. This does not mean trust in a set of statements about God or doctrines. It's the very opposite. In fact, it's a radical trust in God. The opposite of trust is not doubt or disbelief as we've sometimes been led to believe. The opposite of trust is mistrust or anxiety or worry. Trust in God's love has transforming power. As I've already said, faith here is not a cent to a system. Faith here is not about certainties. It's a radical trust in God as disclosed in the Jesus story. It's a trusting relationship rather than intellectual assent. A third meaning of faith sees or defines faith as faithfulness. This is faithfulness to our relationship with God. And in this relationship, there's loyalty, allegiance, and a commitment to be our deepest selves. It is not faithfulness to statements about God, whether these statements are biblical or creedal or even doctrinal. Faith as faithfulness means being radically centred in God, loving God and neighbour. It's about living faithfully. In other words, it's the practice of the ethics of love, the living out of justice, the commitment to peace. This is important in a context where not a few make the Bible a kind of objective faith. But again, faith is not faith in a book, but trust in a relational God. And the fourth meaning sees faith as vision. And this means seeing the whole, seeing what is, as life-giving and nourishing. It's also seeing things as they should be, therefore making possible a different response to life. A response which allows us to love, a response which enables us to be present to the moment and to give ourselves to a vision that goes beyond ourselves, to the vision of the reign of God. In this sense then, faith is always future oriented. It opens us to the future and it's not just our future, it's God's future, God's kingdom which is also present in the here and now. In the old Christendom model, faith was interpreted almost exclusively as intellectual assent, intellectual assent to doctrines and dogmas and formulations of truth. Much of this derived from Constantine's imposition of correct beliefs or orthodoxy and anything which differed from it as error and heresy. Constantine was really trying to impose order on his secure and pluralistic empire. The medieval church and the churches of the classical reformations all developed models of faith as assent to a set of statements, propositions, doctrines and dogmas. All of this created a history of anathemas, inquisitions, persecutions, silencing, excommunication and categories of us and them also insiders and outsiders. In the post-Christendom era, this model of faith has run into some very serious difficulty and it is being rejected today by increasing numbers of people in the Western world. It would seem that the Christendom model of belief is being replaced by faith as openness to the mystery of God and to God's future. Spirituality, which some may feel is an elusive term, is nevertheless replacing formal religion and there is a kind of universal trend away from hierarchical, patriarchal and institutional religion. Faith is also being seen as living faithfully 
or living ethically in God's world. Post-Christendom people are much more interested in ethical guidelines and spiritual disciplines than they are in doctrines, dogmas or systems of belief.